two things that that also kind of always puzzled me when 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 reading about lean startup and 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 working with companies. One is is kind of what are the uh, what are kind of what are good indicators that you are on mm. the wrong you know, on the right, right path. path yeah. <laughs> uh, and and that's one thing. And the other part is that that is kind of the whole how do you design experiments. Yes. <laughs> so and 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 I'm. I'm not a kind of a big fan of art, uh, but <laughs> and the thinking about entrepreneurship as an art. But but uh, at least if there's any art in it, is it's kind of how do you design experiments in order to give you whatever uh, yes. <laughs> uh, whatever you need in terms of uh, of data, information, and and, and stuff like that. Uh, and and I haven't seen kind of of from from my reading a lean in, in in the whole lean startup literature say very specific people and say well. What is good experiments? Of course, you have a lot of kind of concrete uh, examples that you do A, B, split test and, yep. and stuff like that. But but if you sit in a specific, do you have kind of a meta frame on how to, should you design an experiment? Yeah, and so that's a great question. And in many ways, it leads into a lot of the new work that I'm doing because I precisely get asked this question a lot. Yeah. And my first my first attempt at a solution was to just go and study scientists and take the scientific method. <laughs> and I would say, you know, so we talk about things like declare outcomes up front make sure the hypotheses are falsifiable. So yeah. you declare something specific, like I'm going to go run an interview and I'm going to get, I'm going to do 10 interviews and I'm going to get eight paying customers. So yeah. you make it so it's very binary, it's either yeah. true or false. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is you want a time box to make sure that we don't just let experiments run indefinitely because yeah. I find that in, in for entrepreneurs, time is the scarcest resource. Mm. Um, you can go and find more investors, get more money, you can hire more people, get people to work pro bono, all kinds of things. But time is one of those things. If the opportunity moves away from you, you kind of miss that window of market opportunity. Okay. So I find that time boxing very important. Um, and so I, I find that there's all of these, th these things where the mechanics of running experiments are somewhat well-defined. And then uh, you know, also when you go into like um, data measurements analysis, we can use like cohort analysis or split tests where yeah. uh, just like a doctor would give one patient the, the real drug and the other a placebo and we measure whether the drug was really effective or not, we can do the same thing, you know, with our customers. We're not yeah. going to drug them, but we're going to give them, <laughs> yeah. you know, one version of the product yeah. or one version of the pitch and yeah. another customer, a different one, and see if we notice behavior differences. Yeah. So I think that some of that is clearly defined, but people still kept asking me saying, you know, I'm doing all these things but I don't know how to declare those expected outcomes no. because either I don't have enough data um, or you know, no one's sharing this. Like I don't know what's a good conversion rate for an iPhone app, so mm. what do I put in there? Yeah. And if I just pick a number, that's where you run into the trap of I can play with those numbers and make it so easy that I'll always succeed. Um, so if I go to my interviews and I say, okay, I just need 10 people to say yes, then I'll go and talk to people and if I get them to so sort of say yes, I can declare that a success. Mm. So that's where I went to saying, well, how do we really quantify these numbers? And I went back to the science world and said, it can't just be running experiments. And we have this misguided notion, I feel, of what true science is about. And it goes back to the ninth grade science class where we all put on you know, small lab coats and we went to the lab and we did all these chemistry experiments or physics experiments, but we weren't making breakthrough discoveries. Oh. We were repeating someone else's work. So exactly. we were going through a series of procedures that were clearly defined and our job was just to make sure we didn't make a mistake, that yeah. we actually got the result that the teacher gave us uh, yeah. beforehand. Yeah. Um, so we think science is that way, and that's why some people say, well, entrepreneurship can be a science because science is just too easy. Yeah. Well, science is a science, and as Eric says, science is very, very hard to get. Yeah. We don't get breakthrough discoveries every day. No. <laughs> so what I found is that even if we go and look at some of the breakthrough innovations, a lot of them tend to be accidental. A lot of them tend to be, there tends to be a missing first step. And you look at someone like Albert Einstein, he was a very bad experimental scientist. Exactly. Very early in his career, his mentors told him, you know, quit this profession, you yeah. know, go and become, do something else, because you're not going to be a good experimental scientist. Yeah. And so he went into the patent office and decided he was going to become a theoretical physicist. But he, once he correctly you know, came up with the, his theories of relativity, predicted the speed of light before anyone measured it, and then a few years later, you know, I think it, it, um, for, for, for him it was a very good thing because people were able to validate that his theory was actually correct only a few years after he made the prediction. Um, he, was then a, he then became a celebrated scientist, but he went back and said it wasn't so much the math and science that I had been using, but really these mental models that I had in my mind. Yeah. And so in physics, we talk about the 
trains moving at the speed of light and shining lights back and forth. But those, those simple models encapsulated the mysteries of the universe in his head, yeah. and he could use them to make these breakthrough insights and then you know, scribble math and science and <laughs> prove some theories out which yeah. then got measured. Yeah. I find that entrepreneurs need the same models. Yeah. Is that before you make, before you run, a, you run experiments, that's why I'm a big fan of some business modeling. I find that in recent years, people you know, have run away from the business plan and have kind of shied away from writing it because no one really reads them. But we need to do some modeling, not just of what our idea is, but also of what are the, the, the mathematical models behind how customers are going to grow. So we can model any business. We can look at a viral business like Facebook or a software as a service business, a hardware business, and there's enough analogs, enough models out there that we can begin to draw um, somewhat predictive models. Now, as someone once said, all models are wrong, some are useful. Um, I think the same thing applies here, is that not all these models are going to be perfect, but they at least give us that goal which we can then measure against. And so we use that model to come up with the predictions we need when we run the experiments. Yeah. Um, and there are different stages, so we can scale down the model. Yeah. And this is where that system thinking comes in, because I find that something that's very interesting when you think of the business as a system, it is an aspect of repeatability to it. Yeah. And to me, the extreme example is looking at Facebook. So Facebook was able to demonstrate Facebook working with a billion people, but they didn't have to go to a billion people. They did it just on a few college campuses at first. Yeah. And they had so much repeatability built in that they convinced their investors, hey, we know how to do this. We have a system of putting this in a, in a, in a, in a new university and getting 80% of the students online in 30 days and 70% of them loving it so much they're logging in every single day. Yeah. It was like clockwork. They're like, we need to do, we had a checklist of things. We do these things and these students behave like we expect them to. Yeah. They went and repeated the same thing with companies and then convinced their investors, hey, this isn't just for students. This can work for anyone. And so then they had this huge valuation and us on the outside were saying, you know, what is, what is Facebook giving these investors to get so much valuation? Yeah. But it's just all that, that predictability built uh, into exactly. it. Exactly. So in your, in your mind, kind of, of <coughs> for you, one of the things that they should be looking for is repeatability. Uh, Absolutely. Repeatability. And, and, and as you say, you may not need kind of a thousand <laughs> or a hundred thousand to, to, to say you can basically start seeing kind of these small signs with, with, a, with a fairly small group of, of, uh, of people, potential customers, right. pilot projects and, 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 and stuff like that. But, but you should look kind of for, for, for what is repeatable so you don't kind of end up in a model that said, well, I, I basically got 10 customers on board, but, but I, I customized yeah. both the story and <laughs> my product and my service a little bit to uh, all of them. Right, so right. and then you don't have kind of repeatability. Okay. Yeah, that, that's precisely it. And and, yeah. and and oftentimes I hear I get some pushback saying that you know when I use the Einstein example, they say, well, you know Einstein had it easy because he was just trying to model the universe. It was dictated by math and science. So yeah. if he cracked the code, he could understand the mysteries. But people are irrational, um, so we can't really predict their behavior. <coughs> but time and time again, if we look at analytics, once you go to a certain scale, you begin to see people behaving irrationally but predictably like clockwork. Yeah. So you can actually model that behavior. And there's a great book by, uh, by Dan Arely called Predictably Irrational, yeah. which is all about these experiments he ran on students at MIT. And he's a, he's a behavioral e economist. So yeah. he gave people two choices. One was not in their best interest, but they predictably took that one because it seemed more appealing. Yeah. But he found that even though they were irrational, they were continuously behaving that same way. Yeah. So again, I, I would say that customers can be modeled, and if yeah. we can model them, we can we can measure their behavior and then make those corrective exactly. actions. Exactly. And the other part that you were saying is that, that uh, and, and this is uh, one of my interesting things, and, and usually because I, I always speak in these kind of pictures and analogies and stuff like yeah. that, <laughs> at least in order to, to, to understand it myself, Uh, but 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 is there also kind of a way to to kind of in entrepreneurship say well what are kind of the analogies that we are looking for but, but because this was kind of uh, if you look at Einstein well yeah. he has the kind of the trains and stuff like that and then he interpreted that into two uh, two uh, two different settings could it be a little bit similar in in, mm -hmm. uh, in entrepreneurship you say well there's an analogy there's someone and, and you have it to say well we use the razor blade model and yeah. whatever kind of model that uh, that you do. Right. Yeah. yeah, so I, I think at, at, the, at the specific business model level, and when we even talk about how breakthrough insights happen in science, a yeah. lot of it is 
is um, looking for analogies. Yeah. So we say Charles Darwin came up with a theory of evolution because he was reading another book by a different Charles, Charles Lyell, yeah. which was a theory of how the earth evolved. Yeah. Um, so it was, a, it was a book on geography. Uh, yeah. But he was reading that on the trip while he was in, in, the, in, in the, um, the islands, and that influenced his thinking. Yeah. So you can almost say that planted that seed, and you say that over and over again. Einstein, while he was in the patent office, had the opportunity to read all kinds of scientific papers that were coming to him. Yeah. So he got this, what we call uh, the 10,000 hours of practice, you know, yeah. really getting a lot of these ideas in and then coming up with his own breakthrough insights. Yeah. So I think that as entrepreneurs too, and you see this as well, as when, um, at least in the US, when Walmart was trying to um, uh, um, build their store out, it was really a one person store. Now it's the biggest uh, supermarket in, in the world. Yeah. But they went and studied their competitors and the innovations, they actually took some of the checkout line innovation from some of their competitors. So they went and studied analogs in their own domains, yeah. sometimes in other domains to bring those in, try them out. Yeah. And if they worked, it worked. Google, for example, didn't invent the auction based ad system. They actually borrowed it from someone else ran a test one day and saw they got incredible results yeah. and then that spun their, yeah. their auction-based ad systems. Yeah. So I find that analogs are very powerful. I've been working on one for the, that meta level. So the way I like to think of the goal of the business model, as I said it in one of the earlier questions, was that I see it as being one of creating customers. And so I look at it as a customer factory. So yeah. I look at it as ultimately what we're trying to build is a system of products and interconnected marketing and all of these things, and they're all sub-components that once we wire them together, we have this predictable output of customers. Yeah. And just like in a factory floor, we can increase throughput, which yeah. means we get more customers, which means we get more profit, all of those kinds of the more yeah. revenue, yeah. or we lower them down. And it's not just a cute metaphor, that's where the system thinking idea kind of got planted, is that we can apply some of the same techniques we do on the manufacturing floor. If we look at a, the way we wire machines, we find that there's a bottleneck in one machine, if we try to improve all the other machines, we're not going to improve throughput because everything is getting choked in that one place. Exactly, exactly. Similarly with our businesses, if we study them in the same way, we find that at any given point in time, there are usually only a few constraints that hold us back. Yeah. And if we focus on those, that's where we identify the right things to focus on, the right experiments to run, and we get the maximum output.